So that feeling is an emotion that might be linked to an embodied relational experience. Yeah. And then that links to an impulse, or it's able to connect to an old impulse pattern, so it can replace and interject from a prior injunction with a new meaning, because there's a relational and emotional experiential component. And I think the my inner critic has a lot of mm. downloads that come from a place from disconnection, from a place of punishment, and yes. from a place of mm -hmm. dehumanizing. So my system really longs for connection. So if there's a relational uh, component there, it will choose that instead of this disconnected um, old structure. But that's just my theory. Uh -huh. I don't know. <laughs> that's not bad. Mm -hmm. So if you have a replacement meaning that is connected with a connection, a positive reward, instead of an older one that's based on a punitive uh, loneliness, abandonment type of motivation. Yeah. It's helping a positive aim and it's reinforcing a relationship instead of constantly obsessing about being in trouble or getting rejected. Maybe that's more active love instead of this takeaway type of love. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Or that's secure attachment. Instead of being avoidant or anxious, now you have a positive meaning that's reflecting encouragement, support, yeah. lightheartedness, uh, try harder. Uh, it's okay to make a mistake. Like with with a meme of try something something else. That's that's from care. That's love. Even if there was despair, fueling mm. it, there's a lot of love in in that, and I can feel it. So I feel drawn to that and yeah. wanting to do that instead of withdrawing because that's what I know. Yes, Ellie gets a lot of credit for that meme. Now I have to look at the actual meeting to see what the context it came out of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who even knows I don't know where it I got pulled from. <laughs> it, it, it's not important even. It, it was Exactly, see? Sometimes it comes out of uh, a different thing, or it could have been a deeper thing. Uh, that's been a while, so... I'm <laughs> Not even sure what it was uh, around. And it can come from a part of you inside, which uh, which just really comes out. So it's like, uh, it, it, yes, but for the recipient, it's like this fresh energy, fresh um, access. For me, it, it feels like it's coming from that. That's from, um, um, I mean, it doesn't feel gendered really, but my maternal space, maternal, mm -hmm. yeah. Something like that. Yeah, nurturing. 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 Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. Then we could be like, uh, channeling archetypes. So when somebody captures the essence of a strong archetypical pattern, then that's a modern uh, archetype meme that's embodied in yeah. someone you know. Well, it's funny because um, I, I was shuffling my tarot deck uh, while just earlier, oh. while while mm. you were playing that, and this this card, the Empress card, flew out oh. like it did. Like I wasn't even picking. Like it just it just flew out. Right, is yeah. that kind of right around then, which is 
um because that that's the archetype so uh that was weird <laughs> interesting <laughs> Empress um, Carl. For me, an empress is someone who's very nurturing and caring for the people she's responsible for. I don't know anything about that all. Not at all. But I do know something about uh, mythological, um, yeah, feminine space. I know that, some of that. But what does the Empress card mean in, in Tarot? Like that. Um, maternal, nurturing. Um, mostly. I mean, there's there's more. This, this is a pretty good um, uh, handbook. But it's... Um, there's a, you know... <laughs> By the way, I'm very pleased to see that you return to Tarot again. Oh, you thanks. threw them away once. Oh well, yeah. Well, okay. I I I I ex I embellished when I said that I threw them away. I did. I put them away, and I was go I was I planning on throwing them. them away. And mm -hmm. I did say that I'd thrown them away. And but I'd I'd packed them all up, and I'd I'd put them out, and I was thinking of throwing them away, and I didn't. Um, and then months later, I did. I I went and dug them out again, and yeah. I'm very pleased because you're. A natural gravitating to being good in this. So I, I thought it was, yeah, I, I, it made me feel sad. If you oh. stop it. I got, I got a little paranoid um, around the whole, all of that, you know, occult Ooh. esoteric stuff. Um, Cause I was new to it. And, and, and then I started listening to some Christians and, uh, and they were so paranoid about it. And then I don't know, I just, I wasn't really sure. And the Vatican is always watching you. Yeah. <laughs> like that. Uh, <laughs> so. Well, it's um, in, in a way like uh, uh, embodied memes as well, isn't it? But if it's overused, then you, you don't have space to integrate it. But if it's done a little bit, it's just a guide, which can act like, uh, like, uh, like a message, like a, like a messenger to, to open something. So, so here, Chantal, you asked what this, just in, in one sentence, um, the Empress, she is motherhood, love, gentleness. But at the same time, she signifies uh, sexuality, emotion, and the female as mistress. Well, I don't know. But, but. Mm -hmm. Mistress, nice. Oh, someone's noticing accent <laughs> My... or behavior patterns. So at least tells. <laughs> I'm I'll, I'm also the archetypal Canadian. Yes, <laughs> that too. Very good. Is so we've talked about. Is what? mistress synonymous with the word war, or is it a lady in red? Is there a difference between mistress and and, and temple prostitute? Yeah, absolutely. That's, okay, so is absolutely. mistress a higher? Is that a higher standard? A much higher standard? Like one who's more, I guess, tapped in with the yeah. A mistress usually has one partner, who happens to be a married person. That's a mistress, and a temple uh, prostitute would be have many lovers, uh, have, have be accessible to everybody. A temple and there's no prostitute great between them because these are two totally separate. Yes, things. I think that's what Michael said. Temple prostitute. Yes, he, said, he said temple prostitute. Yes, that seems like an interesting combination. Yeah, I've mm -hmm. never heard the term before. <laughs> yes, oh, yeah, it's a Roman thing. No, it's a Roman oh, thing, okay. I believe. Corinthian, it's a what? The it's a sacred sexuality. It's yeah. a, a complete other right. That's nothing to do with the uh, mistress. It was a practice in Corinth. Uh, I'll see if I can find anything online about it. I believe oh. it was Corinth. Okay. Michael's throwing that into the room. Temple prostitute. <laughs> yeah, it's an ancient practice in uh, Asia and... Uh, 
in old Egypt, it was also there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it originates from fertility, so worshipping of fertility. Worshipping of fertility. Yeah, that's the origin of that. Uh, It's 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 a rite. It's a, a more than a ritual. So there's there's this whole process around it. Yeah, but it's the Greeks stole it ritual. from others. Mm. So it's not only Greek. It's much older than that. Yeah, I'll, I found something else. A uh, sacred prostitution. Uh, yeah sacred prostitution so we'll see what wiki says about it if you want to share it with the group me or are you going to share it yeah i'm sharing it in uh, the link I mean, yeah it, i'm it's great can't you, you summarize it for us all right i'll read it <laughs> use your uh, god voice put a little sacred, sacred prostitution in there <laughs> Uh, nope. Sacred prostitution, temple prostitution, cult prostitution, and religious prostitution are purported rites consisting of paid intercourse performed in the context of religious worship, possibly as a form of fertility rite or divine marriage. Scholars pref prefer the terms sacred sex or sacred sexual rites in, case, in cases where payment for services is not, not involved. The historic the historicity of literal sacred prostitution, particularly in some places and periods, is a controversial topic within the academic world. Historically, mainstream historiography has uh, considered it a probable reality based on the abundance of ancient sources and chroniclers detailing its practices, although it has proved to be different between true prostitution and sacred sex without remuneration. Authors have also interpreted evidence as secular prostitution administered in the temple under the patronage of fertility deities, not as an act of religious worship by itself. However, scholarship in the 21st century has challenged the veracity of sacred prostitution as a concept, suggesting that the claims are based on mistranslations, misunderstandings, or outright in inventions of ancient authors. However, there is mention of it in the Bible. I could find that uh, there is mention of it. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's the basic wiki talk about it. Somehow a deity is involved. Sale of a person's bodies or some portion, if not all, of the money or goods received for this transaction belongs to a deity. How come... How did this fall out of style? What? Why isn't there more of this now? What happened? <laughs> yeah. Catholic Church. <laughs> Religion Why couldn't other churches continue this? Why? Yeah, they erased everything because all these old traditions they were, yeah. We can't worship fertility any, anymore. No, Is that the issue? all these old traditions they are gone mm. because religion doesn't like that because then people will be in powers. So, no, they need slaves. We'll see <clears throat> what this pointer does for today's meeting. Thank you, Michael. Temple prostitute. That was my bad because I was looking into the Hebrew earlier today where it was um, Kodesh versus Kadesh Shah. And Kadesh Shah is temple prostitute, whereas Kodesh is to be set apart. So the difference between being set apart versus basically pouring yourself out energetically to other people. And the Hebrew was trying to, I guess, explain that. Mm -hmm. Versus being set apart. <clears throat> huh. So how to take this and cover containment and communication? <laughs> uh, 
Well, sacred prostitution, you're using a deity to enhance uh, fertility or sex. That's uh, using a very ancient archetype in a religious institution to add more containment, to add more blessings, to add more direction, or even just protection, having that uh, the religion or the church or that organization to, to be part of it. And then maybe our memes are a container to have a new instruction, a more nurturing uh, feminine energy or encouraging type of space, a directive, a statement that that matches or can replace uh, and interject that's more punitive and judgmental. You can have something that's more relational, more warm. And uh, that without that extra containment of a person, a tangible feel, then it's hard to replace uh, a childhood interject where you had a caregiver that was embodying that energy. So this sort of ritual aspect of communication might be at the lower levels of communication. Metaphorical, relational, embodied, uh, archetypal. Uh, that connects to a deeper part of ourselves. And then if the abuser is channeling from the dark void of evil, they're channeling a really powerful energy also. So you need something that's counter powerful of something that's highly relational, maybe sacred, nurturing, encouraging to address this sort of uh, heart wound, this love wound, this absence wound that you got from a abusive parasitic, life-sucking, soul-murder type of injury from an abuser. Yeah. But all this stuff is impossible to talk about because it's ritual space, it's archetypical space, it's inherently be below language. But we'll try anyways. Just got nothing else to do. And the, the pollinators want to just fly over to the flower, suck you dry, and then blame you for not having enough pollen. Mm. So it's kind of like this weird male to female merge where I guess when you start to set boundaries and own your own space, you see where people are drawing off of your energy field and it's like no stop but they built their whole identity around getting something from you and so it's like no stop and, and it's just it's so weird how they grab on to this idea of what they can get well they need, they need trauma they need supply therefore you have to neutralize it if your energy when you're responding to the the uh the merge is no stop. What if they're feeding off that no stop? What if it makes it juicier? <laughs> if they can eat your boundary, consume your boundary by when you say no stop, they might actually want to evoke. Yeah, they want you to a violate. Boundary. No, they, if yes. you violate your own boundaries, then then you're you're basically simping out, you know, and 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 not standing up for anything. They, they, I'm sure they get low, so much more loose when, when you, when you basically rape yourself. Well, if you split yourself into looking at the world through good and bad and a boundary and judging yourself for not holding up to your boundaries, that makes that, that life force more delicious. Yeah. 
Do you see the trap? I guess the trap is also part of the drama. I mean, it, it's it's hard to ignore. Yes, they want the drama. Yeah. And when you start hating yourself and fragmenting yourself and seeing the world as dangerous and not trusting uh, the Empress energy, the divine deities, not trusting your relationships and trying to trust your own willpower or your superego, that is drama. That feeds the, the predator. Yeah, the, the predator right now is showing up as a damsel in distress with like a super active id and a lot of work to do. And then one day she wants to be wife and the next day she wants to be daughter. And, and it just makes no sense. So I, I just I just focus on myself and then it's like, oh, daddy, will you pay for this? It's like, don't you have a job? And, and yes, uh, but if she's a shapeshifter, to get into your defenses. And then as she shapeshifts, if she can switch from safe damsel into predator or whatever, that confuses you, that makes the supply better. Because she's giving you the narrative. She's controlling the frame. If you're reacting to it, that's what a predator wants. That's what an abuser wants. So right. the way out is to level up, <laughs> to not fall into the trap, <laughs> to call deeper archetypes or equal archetypes. And the call is to call equal archetypes of more love, more heart, more connection for long term. Short term, you can use some side deities or hire some mercenaries, but long term. <laughs> <laughs> Repetition compulsion. Long term, you want to invest in uh, the, the older archetypes. I use a pointer of shared humanity, but if you have deep Mother Earth nurturing Empress energy, that might be comparable or maybe even uh, more connective. So we're talking about um, maybe something called ritual language, which is tricky. So here's one framing uh, of four levels of communication, our thinking. In poetry, there are four types of language that connect with four types of thinking. Concrete thinking and concrete language. Emotional or psychological thinking and language. Metaphorical or mythological language and thinking, ritual thinking and ritual language, and he said that's so far out from where we're at. You know, I don't even know how to talk about it yet. So it's sort of easier to talk about metaphorical, mythological language. To talk about ritual language, it requires more than talk. <laughs> So ritual is getting into the essence of the energy. Ritual is talking about embodying and acting out a sacred energy or a deeper energy or an archetypal energy in a relational form where it's embodied and it's more than tangible. And that might be able to counter somebody who's channeling uh, a deep entity that's just hungry for fear or your life force, a soul murdering type of void has to be countered by an equally strong ritual space. But by definition, science takes away meaning and sucks at metaphor. So science can't do the bottom two and it probably sucks at the emotional psychological level also. So then psychology, uh, gives you medication to try to make sure you don't feel like imposter syndrome because at an innate level, <laughs> you aren't building the skills of mythological intelligence and you're building the skills of deep rituals. But he talks a little bit about rituals, I think. Ritual poetry and ritual thinking. 
the, the best poets know that. Robert Bly was absolutely the best one that I ever experienced in giving a poetry reading that he had movement, he had music, he had the voice, he had to say it again. I mean, it was all, all of that. I mean, it was alive. So a body, a person, if they mix multiple uh, levels of communication and audience participation, they can make a poem, a song, a message come alive. And that lived experience of that communication from a shared ritual might be part of this ritual intelligence. And in a sense, if you have re repetition compulsion, you're going to another body that reminds you of some past trauma, and you're trying to get this combination to act out, to reenact this old pattern of unfinished business. Except you're not giving them instructions, they're not giving you instructions, so the odds of you finishing the ritual are very low. And the pattern is you repeat the you repeat the, the injury, the incompleteness, and that's why they call it repetition compulsion. You keep doing it, but it doesn't finish. And that's what poetry is. Poetry is this invisible, uh, what I call uh, the electrified emptiness. Space. Silence. There's a point. They have to be in here. That's electrified emptiness for me. And if a poem doesn't have electrified emptiness, you're not into the ritual thinking. So electrified emptiness, space, silence, somebody or a group that makes the poem and the words come to life or potentially summon an old archetype or channel Mother Earth, Divine Feminine, some sort of deeper nurturing spiritual awakening for uh, Christians. Isn't that the founder of DBT? Somehow she got a spiritual awakening that led her to the insights. Maybe it was related to a Buddhist temple or is it a christian one uh, she found zen she found yeah. zen and mm -hmm. and realized that these were the the keys the tools that that uh people like her borderlines like her needed were missing that sends transcendent experience open this portal uh, the 12 step founder john something or mark something, whatever. He had a spiritual experience before he had mapped out the 12 step. So maybe both of those are ritual experiences or connecting to deeper, uh, unconditional love from a deity or from an archetype or from whatever pointer you want to use. And if that's a counter, And then they reversed engineered a, a 12 step program or something around it. But the essence, the ritual, right, that deep meta communication, that's something that maybe is neglected. Or the Shakti blast. Steve has background noise. We chew temporarily. So meta communication is another framing. This is a bit less essency, but a bit more practical, but I think it's sort of the same territory of getting beneath the words, getting into the field, trying to make the message alive because our souls connect to a, a message that's alive. Whether it's panic, urgency, fear alive, or unconditional love that destroys all self type of 
alive. We're drawn to drama. Maybe that's another problem some people are dealing with. Real life is kind of boring, right? Meta communication. Hey guys, sometimes it happens that we see some kind of inconsistency in a person. And if you're really sharp, you can see how she's phrasing her statements <laughs> in a meta <laughs> hypnotic way. <laughs> That's the advanced teaching. We see some kind of inconsistency in a person's communication. We do not know which level of communication to respond to. If you're sharp, you can see the inconsistencies, inconsistencies of how she's adding extra layers. <laughs> Meta communication is the communication that is happening through your body language, through your non-verbals, what the person is able to observe and feel but not really able to define. Meta communication feel but not really able to define. So there's this murky space of communication that you can evoke a feeling in yourself and the other person that's right at the level of uh, undefined or slightly defined or the definition is a bit murky and that I'm going to argue starts evoking ritual space or it evokes flashbacks or it evokes nonverbal memories or it evokes just you know pre-verbal two-year-old, three-year-old, pure utterance, utterances, energy, and we respond to that because that's our substructure. But we don't pay attention to it now because we're so rational. We focus on the content. We forget the meta. We forget the context. We forget the latent content of communication. Meta communication, this happens at an unconscious level. So sometimes it happens that a person is saying something to us, but the feeling that we are getting from whatever he's saying is not in sync. This causes confusion in the mind of the listener. The listener is not able to understand which level of communication to respond to, what is being said or what is being observed. So this could be a test in future communications if you're dealing with something confusing. Do you latch on to what's said? Or do you forget, or are you able to remember what you're observing, what you're feeling, what the context is? And this will be hard with someone who's really good at metacommunication because they're, they're going to guide your attention or your attention is going to be guided by what's on the surface. And it's hard to catch what's under the surface. And if they're channeling an entity or an archetype, they're not even thinking about this. They're just flowing with pure life force. Meta communication. So sometimes we prepare ourselves so much mentally. When I see this person, I need to confront him and this is what I need to say and this is what I need to say. Turns out it's not exactly important what you say. But the question is, how do you say it? So instead of focusing on the words, if we focus on our state, we will be in control of our communication. We will be this is called overpromising <laughs> and framing two opposites to trap you into thinking that state is some magical answer. <laughs> I would try to lower the charge and say, it's not about controlling your state. It's about building your capacity to recognize language at more levels. And it's not even about catching the other person's language. The more you can be congruent with your communication from the depths of your soul, from your open heart, if you're congruent, you can feel somebody else who's slightly off. Or you won't get knocked off by them being off because you're, you're more in line. If you're in this framing of avoiding getting trapped, avoiding the danger, Grasping onto control. Somebody who feeds off that, you're making yourself more delicious to them. (laughs) 
for people who listen to lots of YouTube channels or wounded healers, after you leave them, do you leave them more paranoid? <laughs> Are you more calm? Just recognize your state after you're listening to them to get a clue what emotions, what ritual energy are they pulling out of you after you, you watch their video. After you go to a meeting, are you looking for red flags everywhere? Are you yelling yourself with all these injunctions you have to remember? What's the leftover charge that's a ritual communication that they're giving you? We don't reflect on this. In fact, when there's a reflection video that comes, somebody just floods a bunch of noise because talking about reflection was too <laughs> scary. Inside joke. Be able to get through to the person in a way that we want to. This is not random. This can be very much controlled. So... This can be very controlled, very much. Look at these loving eyes when she says this can be very much controlled. Look at the confidence in her eyeballs. <laughs> this is not coming from a skill. This is something that's a, maybe a, a desire that she wants to control this, but she's trying too hard. My interpretation. So when we say something that we don't mean, when we crack a joke, which is not meant as a joke, it causes discomfort in the mind of the listener. The person does not know which level of communication to be taken as serious one. Should he take what he is listening as serious or should he take what he is feeling as more important? Meta communication, the person is saying something to us but the feeling that we are getting is not in sync. Meta communication, the person does not know which level of communication to be taken as serious one. Meta communication. Which level to take as a serious one? <laughs> Doesn't she look so relaxed? <laughs> this is what happens when you take too many NLP and hypnosis courses. You can go through the motions of creating a mind state, but ultimately you're channeling your own insecurities into the message. Because we connect soul to soul. So actors treat it differently. They actually want you to do the opposite. Sort of, let's see. How to communicate authenticity from an actor's pers perspective. When we're new, we like to force an emotion. We like to force expressions because we have an idea that, oh, well, if I don't, show them I'm feeling this way, they're not going to see it, right? Wrong. That's not how it works. In film, you have to feel it and not show it because the camera will catch you lying. The camera can look into your soul and see everything. So a lot of narcissistic abuse uh, channels will recommend that you record conversations because that helps with gaslighting, because sometimes the abuser will tell you that you heard things wrong and remember things wrong. So having an objective third party uh, recording or somebody else who is there to get that feedback. But also, if you can rewatch stuff and get in touch with congruence, then you can feel the essence of messages. So then slowly you might be able to spot what's real, what's coming from the soul. And then maybe what's coming from something else. And can't really teach you this. <laughs> this is why people who grew up with secure attachment, they don't complain about narcissistic abuse because they get creeped out by abusers. So they, they don't make friends with them. But codependents say like, oh, Love bomber, let me repetition compulsion. Let's get married tomorrow. That's, that's the grooming. So act naturally. Camera can look into your soul. And the shortcut is if you look into someone's eyes and build eye contact and stay with 
somebody's eyes. I can look into people's eyes and I think I can get a feel for their souls, whether they're looking outward, whether they're looking inward, whether there's pure terror and confusion coming out, coming out of their eyeballs, out of their pupil tension. But I can't teach that because I think, uh, might be my superpower or I'm just guessing. I don't know. But there are pointers that eyes are the windows to the soul and see everything. So in theater, that works. In theater, you can fool people a little bit better. But in uh, in film, uh-uh, no, no way. People are gonna catch you fast. The trick is, is to not show anything. Trust yourself, trust you did the work you were supposed to do to understand this character, and then have fun playing the character. Be in the moment. Feel it and not show it. Be in the moment. Feel it and not show it. Be in the moment. Feel it and not show it. And that's probably a good tip too. The more you can feel it and have no expression or limit your expression, the more you're con communicating the essence. The more you try to force the message, the more an abuser can sense that or feed off that or want to reject you and they'll get a high off of defying you. So. Channeling feeling opens the door to deeper levels of communication. This is a secret from uh, ISTDP about, they labeled it as seven phases of pressure. I would label it as three levels of consciousness and then three levels of unconscious communication. And right in the middle is feelings, heart. So, short video, but uh, a bit boring, but I think it's very uh, practical and useful and actually maybe too useful. So I might need to uh, figure out how to break this down slower. So what are the phases of pressure? What's the problem you'd like me to help you with? Next phase, is that a problem you want me to help you with? Pressure to will. Could we look at a specific example? Pressure to specific example. What's the feeling toward your father in that example? So this is right in the middle, feelings. And a lot of psychology focuses on emotional literacy. But that's just the middle. That's just right at the surface of unconscious. Underneath the unconscious is the next three. Okay, pressure to feeling. How do you experience that rage toward him physically in your body? Pressure to the experience of, of the rage. And what's the impulse that goes with that rage? Then pr pressure to portrayal. How do you picture that rage going out on your father in thoughts, words, and ideas? So it helps you see, actually, we have phases of pressure. But when we're in portrayal, we don't ask, how do you feel it in your body? We ask, how does it want to go out on him? Because pressure to portrayal is pressure to dreaming. This is oftentimes is not taught. So it's really... This is not taught. I haven't heard people teach this. <laughs> Simple, but <laughs> people focus on the feelings. They get a little to somatics experience. Few people work with impulse. They might do it intuitively, but they don't talk about it. And then for trails, they just label it as emotional flashbacks and say, go fix them or something. Really, really important to understand this really helps clean things up for you and helps you be very focused and consistent. So you're really doing pressure to the dreaming, pressure to the dreaming. So we were talking about ritual space making messages and communications and stories come alive, channeling archetypes, I would say that's sort of number six and seven. And then number five is embodying it. And then maybe number four is how to activate it, how to get into deeper energies, how to open a portal to a ritual space or to access 
a memory of yours that's preverbal. Maybe the only way you can communicate it is by portrayal. Maybe it's not even by portrayal by dreaming. Maybe it's portrayal through transference, through projection, through counter transfers, through acting out and reliving the memory through portrayal. It's sloppy because it's not linked to impulse and experience all this other stuff. It's a fragmented memory. So the more you can link all these together, the more you can contain and integrate the out of control portrayal. But if we have this rule that says acting out is bad, aggression is bad. So anytime you leak out portrayal, you get judged and you judge yourself. You're just stopping your impulse or other people are stopping your impulse instead of being curious to say, okay, here's an impulse that's responding to something. And then there's betrayal and there's all of this other uh, confusing acting out. Can we translate what the unmet need is? Can we translate? Why do you, why is it sticking? Why do you have repetition compulsion? What if all you need is somebody to just finish the story? You might not even need anything. <laughs> what if your portrayal just needs to be seen, needs to be witnessed, need to, needs to be honored, like it's a, a spiritual, sacred message? Possibly validation? Well, validation, but make sure it's validation from a portrayal level, not from a feeling level. Betrayal level, okay. From a ritual level, from your spirit is agonizing, wanting to send you a message. <laughs> so you keep reliving this repetition compulsion. You keep having this nightmare. You keep having this passionate dream towards a certain energy. If it keeps fucking happening to you, it might be because it's a message that you haven't I've been finished. figured out. Yeah, I've it's been... unfinished business. Yes really resonates with the beef, mm -hmm. especially after the last meeting, getting it out. So we're giving, we're encouraging you to have space so that you can consider this deeper acting out or confusion that's in your system might be an unfinished portrayal and yes. unfinished ritual. Absolutely. I guarantee yeah. it. A cry for help from your inner children. I see that now. Yeah. And it's not for us to dictate what that message is. It's up for us to try to use our creativity to try to translate it better, yes. to communicate with the portrayal or encourage it to give you more information. We're talking you get about free from that. Yeah. So we were talking about that last meeting. Mm -hmm. After party. Yes. Somehow things are getting stirred up and people's unconscious might be wakening up. I think it's because Kelly is having breakdowns and it's triggering everybody else. Gaelic <laughs> <laughs> <Ayla> Kelly. Because <laughs> it's contagious. Yes. But isn't that why we're all here? Oh, we didn't do a survey. Yeah, I thought we were going to do a survey. Or a poll. Well, that's the so Sam Backman things. That could be labor. <laughs> so I don't know how to link that to communication. <laughs> so meta communication, ritual communication. Nonverbals. I was going to try to dive into psychosis, but I'm not, that's kind of a jump. Actually, psychosis would dive into hyper reflexivity, which I sense is useful, but Bunker, Jameer, I think it's hard to get. Bunker, Jameer, Green, let's go for it, Beef. So this is a clue that Sam Backman shared in earlier videos that I sort of caught but it caught my attention more on a revisit. And it's a very nice nuanced framing of uh, narcissism is too much uh, 
inside. And then psychosis or hyperreflexivity or maybe autistic floor is an issue of too much outside and an issue of too much self. Getting lost in too much hyperreflection. Which is hard to describe because it we've been using self as a framing, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> so what is a problem? What is somebody who has the opposite problem? Somebody who has too much self. <laughs> then that's too much reflection. Hyper. Deep, you froze. Reflection. Out. He's mentally invested in reality. People with narcissism. I froze. People... Am I unfrozen? Am I back? Yes, mm -hmm. you are. I'm still frozen. No. Oh, you could. Other two good things now. are moving. Okay. <laughs> what did you care if I'm frozen? You're supposed to fill in the gaps. Just pray to your deity. <laughs> Healthy people are emotionally and mentally invested in reality. People with narcissism, people with psychosis, they're emotionally invested internally. Narcissism is a form of introversion. There's no ego. There's no constellated self. There's just this fragmented, fractured landscape, chaotic and kaleidoscopic. So narcissism is one way of trying to defend against this internal disorganization by rigidly attaching self-states to defense mechanisms. The second condition is psychosis. Psychosis is different. And it might not be just psychosis. It might be schizoid. It might be autistic. It might be the psychotic side of borderline. <laughs> but we focus on narcissism because uh, empty schizo core, the one-layered self, all that stuff, it's sort of easier to make sense of. Plus, Sam Backman has a bias to describe it because he's a narcissist, or he identifies. So the side, psychotic side, it's hard to get a good self-aware psychotic to describe their landscape because they kind of suck at communication by definition. <laughs> They'll give you rabbit holes and metaphors that'll just make your brain hurt. So simplifying the psychotic sense of self is very hard. And maybe that's why it's scary. So if I can help put words to it, when you reach psychotic states or you merge with somebody who is a bit more too much self, it might be less intimidating. Maybe you're just diving into ritual space and that's a time to call a deity. That's a time to be curious, to honor it with space. Don't get too close. <laughs> Watch what's happening. Give it space because this is infinite imagination. But psychosis, what's their defense? The second condition is psychosis, which is exactly the opposite of narcissism, actually, where there's opposite. only a self, only an ego. There's no world. The world is the self. The world is the self. And so there again, the defense would be to associate specific self-states with specific defense mechanisms that keep the world out, that keep the world out. So you also have defense mechanisms, but the defense mechanisms are to keep flooding of too much reality so that you just merge with the self as world. It's a different type of terror. That's where the schizoids have life anxiety and neurotics have death anxiety. Too much life and too much social interaction for schizoids floods their sense of uh, existence. So that's a sort of easier framing. The autistic is flooded by a sensory flood of something that'll flood them and all they feel is that one sensory thing and they lose touch with reality, but they can't escape. So once you, the autistic floor, you fall into one trigger, 
you start merging with everything. You can't escape. You fixate on the trigger. And your defense against the trigger becomes yourself. Because that's something you can sort of hold on to while you're drowning into merging with everything. Hard to describe. Because so much of the bias is about a self and the self falling apart. Neurotics obsess about that. Their fucking story. Their story falls apart and they freak out. That's a neurotic response. The narcissist mistakes external objects as internal objects, and the psychotic mistakes internal objects as external objects, a process known as hyperreflection. So I played with a metaphor in person that maybe hyperreflection is shape shifting to expon exponential infinite ability. So you don't even have to consciously, consciously shape shift because you're hyper reflective. You merge with the other, your favorite person, with whatever, with the situation. But your merging also is you lose yourself and become self as wor world. The world is itself. I think he covers a little more in this. We'll see. Psychosis is when it's very difficult to tell apart yourself from the world. When they are merged, you don't have boundaries. You don't know where you stop and the world starts. So if you're in a psychotic state, someone telling you to set boundaries is kind of impractical. <laughs> After the fact, when you have your distance, then you can say it should have had boundaries. But in the midst of a psychotic merge, enmeshment, self is world, there are no boundaries. There is no awareness because it's too much self. <laughs> it's not a self that's defined by story. It's a self that's just in the moment. It might be a flow state. So maybe when I go into self is, is world, I try to define myself based on my process. What's the flow state? What am I, where am I trying to get to? What is this emotion that I'm feeling? What is that directing to? And I try to get a shape based on that. By trying to set a boundary and all this stuff where you don't, you lose awareness of that. It's a stupid advice because it's a neurotic strategy for a psychotic uh, issue. You expand outwards and consume the world and assimilate it. And so you become one with the world. This oceanic feeling that Mary, many gurus and mystics keep alluding to is, I am sorry to say clinically, a psychotic state. Psychosis involves a mechanism called hyperreflexivity. And this mechanism makes it very difficult to tell apart the difference internal objects and external objects, internal voices, introjects, and external voices. That is why psychotics hear voices and they experience hallucinations, which are actually projections of their internal world onto reality. So we focus on that part because they can talk about it. But that just means they have a larger canvas to throw their imagination on. If self is world, their hallucinations and their inner voices and noise can get projected outward onto different people in different situations because self is world, not because they're delusional or they're hearing voices. It's because their sense of self expands outward. They have too much self. It's a hard reframe. <laughs> we're, I think a lot of the confusion is we're using neurotic strategies for somebody, which is somebody who doesn't have enough self. They block themselves from their primitive, lower unconscious parts of themselves. 
hiding in this story, this narrative container of ego. And then they try to keep that narrative ego intact. That's ego defenses. That's all the defense mechanism. Narcissist, narcissistic defenses. So then those tips do not work for somebody who has too much self. Autistic and schizoid and psychotic. That problem is hyper-reflexivity. So this is psychosis. And all children are psychotic. Because we start when, off when psychotic. When children are born, they can't tell the difference between inside and outside. They can't tell mommy apart from themselves because they have no selves. The child, until probably age 18 months, the child cannot separate herself from the universe. She perceives the universe as part of herself and herself as part of the universe. It's a single organism. That's why children react very badly when mommy leaves the room. That's why children need to develop object constancy. In other words, the, the innate belief that objects continue to exist even when they cannot see the objects. So psychoticism is a state where the child is totally fused with his or her environment and doesn't realize that there's anything external to it. Very difficult to tell apart yourself from the world. You don't have boundaries. You don't know where you stop and the world starts. A little trauma at the end, but let's try to stay on hyper self reflection. Maybe that's a, a bridge to try to understand the psychotic experience or the oneness experience, the enmeshment, the merging. Maybe that's why love bombing is so yummy. You get a taste of psychosis and then you have this narrative of finishing some incomplete repetition compulsion. So now I gave you a, an intro to hyper self-reflection. We can try the video that Kelly got to watch a few times. We'll see if anybody else gets tripped out by it. Because I think this guy actually is using a lot of meta communication with his edits. Then I added more edits <laughs> to try to capture the problem of hyper uh, reflection, hyper self reflection. Hyper self reflexivity. If in a meta modernist work, the author is the self being reflected, then he starts off with if. So who's he talking to and why is he talking to? Up to you to figure out because that's how meta communication works. The more undefined you can be and the more you can force the other person to reflect and get lost in the reflection, that's sort of the goal. That's a psychotic communication preference. Someone who's drowning in their psychosis makes you have a mind puzzle, so you drown with them. That's their form of connection. And it's not because they're consciously trying to con you, it's because they've been initiated into the court double bind which comes in Act 3. The double bind of grief to control love is Bateson's early uh, theory of schizophrenia from the 50s, and I think it has a lot of merit now. But that's also Act 3. But I gave you a little break from the hyper-reflection because he's going to do some more So if, what did he say, if? If in a metamodernist work. <laughs> if in a metamodernist work, whatever the hell that means. The author is the self being reflected. The author is the self being reflected.
if the author is a self, if the author is reflecting his self in the work, what? <laughs> Kelly, did you translate this better? <laughs> if the author is a self being reflected, <laughs> that seems wordy. <laughs> you got no way to simplify that better? <laughs> I'm trying to remember what I said to that. Uh, if Oh, it comes later. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> if the author is being the self reflected, that's the conditional first. Of being reflected, then that self reflection can provide a base for the audience's own self reflection. So you have to remember the conditional to the end. So if the author is able to write in a way or present in a way, to share self-reflection from himself, he can create a canvas for the audience to have some self-reflection or, or he can flood the audience with self-reflection to damn them into schizoid folding in this. <laughs> He's going to present a bias that self-reflection is all positive. I'm going to add some shit on top of that because uh, too much self-reflection is evil or painful or just wasted. So if the author writes in a way, the audience can also reflect more. By being the self of a work, one can only highlight one's own lived experience. So if you put yourself into your work, you can only talk about it from your lived experience. However, by being the base for someone else. In contrast, you can be the base for somebody else. So maybe you can be a canvas for somebody else. To reflect upon their lived experiences through you, this is what they call hyper self-reflexivity. So if you can communicate in a way that negates yourself, and negates the audience and negates the message, you can highlight reflection. You can amplify sight thoughts and start thinking postmodern naturally. And then you feel like you're a smart postmodernist. And the people that are reading it think like they're smart postmodernists and they're totally impractical in the real world because everyone's just folding inward and self-reflection and saying, this is so amazing. I'm so meta. You're so meta. Let's all reflect by negating communication. <laughs> we're going to ne negate me, the sender. We're going to ne negate you, the receiver. We're going to negate the message and we're going to ne negate the context. <laughs> so all you have is just a lot of awareness hyper self-reflectivity and that is beautiful hyper self-reflexivity hyper as the author says it's like breaking the fourth wall Be ha breaking the fourth wall so if you have a bit of psychotic skills to navigate the territory, you can now dive into this territory of breaking the fourth wall. You can do it more skillfully, or you can do it more sloppily, or your sense of reality and inside the story gets confused. Or you can use breaking the fourth wall to have another layer of meta to communicate to others, to try to act out ritual space together. Let's together break the fourth wall and make the teaching more alive. To include our body, to include our heart, to include our blood, sweat, and tears. To make the performance matter more than anybody's personal story. To make the performance a devotion to the divine.
this pure essence of just loving and serving the divine, will that open a channel to get downloads of truth, to get downloads of blessings? So maybe this space of hyper reflexivity could be adaptive if it's used in the right spirit, but if it's used to consume others or to control the outcome, then it gets distorted and uh, tainted or repetition compulsion to repeat the old stuff. Because once you enter psychosis, <laughs> that's liminal space. Any kind of change or any kind of summoning can happen. Because it highlights specifically the importance of the lived experience. That reflection is the ultimate goal. That being aware of what one is living through, learning and experiencing, is the ultimate goal. Isn't this the spirit of ritual? <laughs> of music performance, of any sort of performance? To focus on your performance? your ceremony, your interactions with the person in that moment and trying to make that the most lively, the most pure, the most spontaneous. We just don't call it that when you're in a concert and you're performing and you're on the line or you're doing something that's highly meaningful to you. But it's sort of the same goal here that he's describing one is living through, learning and experiencing, is the ultimate goal. That in itself is incredibly beautiful. The goal is to bring as much life, life force, preciousness, sacredness in that performance, in that interaction, in that love. That's a way to amplify sex. So you could just have the base animal sex, or you could try to amplify to make it more present, to make the mood right, to make the passion and the love more levels. So that's a bit more easy to see how the body is involved with sex. But you can do the same thing with a conversation, with a meal, with a, a special event, with a meeting. You can try to amplify the life force. With hyper-reflection, positive psychosis, to put your body in an empty state, to download your innate wisdom from the soul and from archetypal divine entities and stuff. Or ancestors. You could be trying to honor your ancestors who are watching and probably dumped you with too much burdens. We lost Kelly. See what happened? Too much hyper reflection. Oh, you said standby. <laughs> if not magical. The idea here is to tap into a. Oh, that in itself not is incredibly beautiful. If not magical. The idea here <laughs> is to tap into a hyper human. Hyper human. Hyper human. Hyper human could be labeled as fragile, as vulnerable as exposed, as scary. Is that the other side of paranoid transference by the paranoid schizoid state? Hyperhuman. The idea here is to tap into a hyperhuman, hyperhuman, hyperhuman. Hyper reflexivity equals hyperhumanity. Hyperhumanity means you're too human. You don't have enough defenses against reality. You're exposed to predators. That's also trauma bonding. 
That's why the life force is so charged. Maybe. But if this is a hyper-reflective state where you're merging with the world, self is world, trying to set up a defense in a hyper-human state is a wrong uh, medication. It's a wrong thing. You're merging with the world. You're merging with self is world. You're an empty channel. Can you call on a deity? Can you call on, call on nurturing energy to be your defender instead of you trying to set up a boundary? Can you call on memes of people you know that inspire you to give you energy, to give you an extra boost? To offer a little more containment. Would you say that calling on a deity or a power greater than oneself can sometimes be represented in the mushroom? Like if you just take a decent dose of Amanita muscaria, user beware, um, you get transported into whatever spirit or the goddess or the divine needs you to know in the moment <laughs> by getting outside of your own way and dying well, to yourself. Aren't <laughs> mushrooms like one of the most ancient herbs or something, funguses. So you're tapping into a really ancient uh, herb or a fungus, and yeah, it's a I mean, fungus that's that's part of the roots of the earth. So you're tapping into a very charged portal to Mother Earth, maybe. Sure. I think psychiatry would would still um, think of it as the wrong move but I, I suppose in a controlled setting yeah I mean sometimes I do just need to let the ego die and the mushrooms are really effective uh, mushrooms effective but maybe instead of saying the ego must die maybe you just need to merge with the world maybe it's already happening you don't need to let it happen you don't need to force your ego to die Yeah, I guess I just become more grateful when I come back. <laughs> That's part of it too, is you when you let yourself go in that way. You have to just learn how to go in and out of this in-between state. Surf that edge. Maybe have other people that are skilled in this liminal space to encourage you to take away the scariness. Maybe you need a temple prostitute. You can restart it because you open with that. <laughs> maybe this is a path of tantra so we say it's just colloquially it's sex but tantra is just working with desire desire as a portal for enlightenment so that can be rage that can be fear that can be sexual desire all of those are fair game in, in tantra I'm so bad I'm so bad Your accent is hard for me to hear. Other people translate. Did he say, did he say submit? It's like submit. Something of that nature. His timing is slightly different. So he flew it into the room. We'll work with it. Maybe. <laughs> Back to hyper-reflection. A deeply felt experience. That's amazing. So it's a path of feeling something deeper. I would say at the impulse and the portrayal and the ritual space. And using that as your anchor. Using that as your grounding using that to reconnect to your soul. Because if you're dealing with soul murder, maybe you have too much hyper-reflexivity, you have too much hyper-humanity, so your wound is soul murder, so you got to work towards connecting deeper, 
deeper feelings. And then my pointer has been follow your pain, but that's a hard sell. Even Chantal didn't like it for um, months or years. <laughs> pain allows you to localize yourself. If you're hyper reflective and you can jump all over the place because your self is world, you have to localize yourself <laughs> in your body. Pain is the quickest way to localize where you are and where other people are are because you're not going to feel other people's pain. So pain allows you to find yourself, to localize yourself. And then you can go deeper in your localized self through pain or pleasure or desire or sex, whatever, but something that's <laughs> that can localize you. I don't care. Deep feeling, what he said here. Human, hyperhuman, a deeply felt experience. A deeply felt experience probably is a portal. And if you're with a, a neurotic, a deeply felt experience is threatening to their superego, so they're going to squash and attack you from their most vicious superego policing if you feel too much. Because feeling too much threatens their story, their ego containment through a story narrative. So they can't witness you reconnecting your soul from a psychotic, liminal space. That's amazing. Hyper self-reflexivity. And that is beautiful. Reflection, reflection, reflection. And people used to criticize me because I would just say, oh, that's beautiful. So somehow you copied my line, or maybe that's the line of hyper-reflexivity. <laughs> Hyper-humanity, it's beautiful, whether or not it's painful, agonizing. More humanity, it's beautiful. God is happy. You're human. So Kelly, did it make more sense? Unfortunately, my internet connection dropped about halfway through. But I caught some of it. Yeah, I did catch some of it. Um, yeah, I think I tried reflecting? to express some. Uh, I'm trying to piece together what your interpretation and mine was and make I'm trying to I'm trying to find points where I connected with your interpretation I guess and I'm having I I missed a chunk of it so I kind of came back and was trying to catch up and I was not really in a good space. Um, Maybe. What's on your mind now? Mm, nervousness and, you know, the usual big put what on the What kind of inner thing. chatter is going on? There isn't a lot of inner chatter. There's just a lot of tension and a lot of fear okay. and about the usual being wrong um if i have to stop and think about it and give a quick assessment the usual being wrong yeah quick assessment if you're reflecting about yourself, talking about a video that's inspiring reflection, how can you be wrong? I don't know, but I can find a way. <laughs> um, you can find a way. Hmm. 
So it feels like you might be in, be in a double bind that's slowing down your thinking. You're reflecting on something you say and you're trying to see how the audience might read it and judge you. Mm -hmm. Instead of getting your thoughts right, you're trying to predict the future based on something that you haven't even done and you haven't even conceived of the words, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a fun mm -hmm. little trap. Yeah. So, what if double binds is the essence of uh, sin? A core essence of humanity, of social conditioning, of neurotic conditioning. So they're in their double binds, and the people that are CPTSD have a different double bind. of trying to avoid punishment or trying not to be afraid of punishment because they got punished for being afraid of being punished. They got punished for expressing fear of being punished. How does a kid get out of that, out of that double bond? So Gregory Bateson and Jay Haley in the 1950s, they were not therapists. Uh, Bateson was an anthropologist and Jay Haley was a librarian. They talked with real schizophrenics in their families and worked out a model. Not having all of those psychological models to project onto the schizophrenics and came up with this double bind theory. which I think is linked to grief. I think it's linked to a lot of splitting, a lot of defenses that we fixate on. It's just, we've fallen into the trap of a double bind of trying to control something that we can't control. Or we're being res held responsible for being human. So if we're hyperhuman, and then we feel fear of punishment, then we have to stop ourselves from feeling fear of punishment when there's evidence of it. That's a double bind. There's no way out. So when you grow up, you have to just say, fuck that rule. You have to be an asshole. You have to have models of other people to encourage you that you can say, fuck this social conditioning. I'm just going to opt out. I'm going to be human. I'm proud to be human. I'm proud to be hyperhuman. Can't help it. So, double binds. That was my opener. Gregory and his colleagues coined the term double bind. The double bind describes a pattern that's like a catch-22, an experience in which there seems to be no solution for escape. The story Gregory used sometimes to explain the double bind was about the gnat in Through the Looking Glass. So this is, I think, his daughter describing this story. This is a more sanitized story, but it's, it's kind of cool. It shows the double bind. Then I'll try to get an edgier version. There's a gnat. And the gnat is a still small voice explaining the insects of Through the Looking Glass land to Alice. We don't have butterflies, we have bread and butterflies. And the bread and butterfly bread and butter has wings of very thin slices of bread and butter and a head made of a lump of sugar. Wings are made of butter and a head is made of lump of sugar. <laughs> Alice says, what does it live on? And that says, weak tea with cream in it. Alice saw a difficulty. It lives on tea or cream or drinks. The difficulty, the double bind is coming. So she said, what happens if it can't find any? The net says, it dies. Alice says, that must happen rather often. The net says, it always happens. 
the double bind in which the bread and butterfly finds himself. Namely, that if he gets his food, his head dissolves in it. Therefore, his only hope of survival is not to find any food, but then he starves. And this is, you see, a formal double bind of the simplest kind. I was told that ulcers. So simple. You lose or you lose. The gnat gets food, the head dissolves and it dies. The gnat doesn't get food, it starves and it dies. This is another one, I think. Um, were things that, um, that you got when you worried. So immediately, I was kind of a weird guy as a kid. I thought, oh my God, what the heck will I do if I start to... worry about ulcer. Then he started worrying about what would happen if he got an ulcer. <laughs> Raising his odds of getting an ulcer. Because the definition is cart before the horse, or it's defining something, <laughs> it ends up being counterproductive. So it's a mind game that can get you into a recursive loop. Mind is a creative imperative. It's the moment when because this doesn't work and that doesn't work, something else is going to have to be improvised. A creative impulse is necessary at that moment to get out of the situation, to take it up a level. Can we see a bigger picture? Can we think about the way that we think? So if someone's born in double binds, could it contribute to hyper reflexivity because you're letting the double double bind define the parameters to trap you then you keep reflecting and reflecting try to get out of it but the way out is to add context <laughs> to get out of that frame but if you don't have anyone modeling that for everybody else is putting each other in double binds as a primary source of connection, of controlling love, of keeping people from feeling their impulses by creating a double bind as a containment strategy for someone who's too psychotic and paranoid because they're hyper-reflecting all over the place because self is world. Double bind is adaptive, so you need to level up to have a deity, have a ritual contain you, have a community of memes that care about you when you get lost in, in world. When you lose yourself, have somebody else be placeholders for you. So then you can work through the, the double bind to see through it. Now this is a more form, more basic form of double bind. And it's from Jay Haley, the person who worked with Greg Bateson. And I think this is a more simpler, but he doesn't really describe the painful nature of it, but it's a simple description. He had an explanation of schizophrenia. The schizophrenics were caused by being punished for expecting punishment. Right there. <laughs> Being punished for expecting punishment. Creates an impossible double bind for a child. You're supposed to turn off your awareness <laughs> of punishment and not game that. <laughs> Numb yourself, which is going to force you to self-reflect. <laughs> You're not allowed to look outward. So then you have all the passive aggression of the schizoids because they can't express their aggression outward to, to navigate dangers because they're being punished for being expecting punish, punishment. And it's easy from a parent's stand, standpoint. And John and I uh, talked to him about this double bind, which he created the term of, and said, how do you know 
a schizophrenic was punished for expecting punishment. Bateson said it happened. He argued that the that uh, parents punish a kid, and when they come near him again, the kid cringes, and then the parents are indignant mm -hmm. that he's expecting punishment, so they punish him again. Mm -hmm. So he's punished for expecting punishment. Reason deductively from general principles. That's right. From the confusion and the schizophrenic communication, he must have been raised in a learning situation where that kind of confusion is appropriate. Being punished for expecting punishment. So where do you find your sense of safety? If you can't defend yourself against punishment by expecting punishment, you have to shapeshift yourself to guess the other person's motives before they're about to punish you. <laughs> then you don't have space to define yourself. You don't have space to find yourself. You're lost in this infinite loop of double binds. And then what if your only way of connecting to other people is through double binds? Because you're binding yourself to find to be a way to be a good daughter or son. That's your way of loving yourself. So when you give grief to others, you're giving others part of your double bind. That's the only way you know how to show love. What if, you know, one of the crazy schizoids that are coming to this group and being passive aggressive in our eyes? That's their inner world. That's them showing themselves to us. We're seeing as parasitic because we have enough of a, some distance from our double binds, but to him or them, maybe double binds is all they know. Can you expand on that a little bit more? I, did, I didn't quite catch the idea of sharing a portion of your double bind as a way to express your love. Well, if you're a child and you got double bind by your parents, the parent punished you for expecting punishment. So then now you want to be a good, good child, good son, good daughter. So you want to not be scared of being punished. You want to be a good person. So that's your way of protecting yourself and being a good person, a moral injunctive, a moral desire, by trying to prevent yourself from feeling afraid of punishment. That's your natural drive is to be aggressive. <laughs> they say, I don't like it, right? <laughs> so your natural drive is to be aggressive outward. You fold your aggression inward to try to stop your natural drive of saying, I don't like that. <laughs> it's not fair. You're folding inward. They don't actually want no. folding in. There. I was folding in, folding in, no energy recycled outward. I was folding in, folding in, no energy recycled outward. I was folding in, folding in, no energy. So you direct your aggression inward and you start folding it inward into an infinite loop that creates an amazing black hole, your self-created void of folding inward. Part of it is hyper-reflection and part of it is using double binds because that's how your parents showed you love. <laughs> you trying to fit yourself into the mold of acting out what your parent uh, punished you with, that you do being in ritual space of containing yourself by folding your aggression inward. And that's how you, instead of communicating love of yourself by setting a boundary and honoring your parent by explicitly sharing uh, your love directionally outward. You only know how to show your love by folded inward aggression. That's all you know. 
Because in order to show your love outwards, you have to target the person. You have to have language. You have to have many layers of showing your love to a person. You're spending all your time folding inward. Create playing with a double bind that's impossible. So when you communicate to somebody else, naturally, you're just going to connect to them through a double bind. Through passive aggression. And neurotic society is going to say that's you know, invasion, boundary crossing, all kinds of negative judgments. But for somebody, that's all they know. That's all they know. Their development is stuck at age five or two or something. They don't have any other higher level connection language. So if they were a physical kid that was doing it, you give them room. But since their body is an adult, we don't give them, we don't give adults room if they have immature levels of connection, communication. Double binds are tough to describe. What if you, part of it was initiated. So if your parents initiated you into a double bind of being punished for fearing punishment, what if that's how they learned how to connect, how to control the chaos of the world? So they got that role modeled from their parent and they just passed it along. How do you be a healthy male in a system where even like if you look at the mitochondria, which comes from the grandma. So the grandma is, is well, the great grandma is, is the queen of the corporate side of the family. The mom inherits the legacy. The grandma is the back end, which silences all of the males that, you know, get too many vaccines basically you know that's how grandpa died and then the dad is shut out of the picture and so it's just if you go against the fem the feminine in any way and try to rise above or individuate beyond the mother you get silence like you're a missense mutation it's like a gene silencing <clears throat> you have to connect with uh, a bigger mother It's just there's no room for the male to, you know, to rise. It feels yes, you have to connect with a bigger mother, Mother Earth, larger divine feminine. Larger context gets you out of the double bond. So trusting women outside of the family. No, you have to trust women that are disembodied. Okay, so so more of a an, an mushrooms and yeah, energy nature or something archetypes maybe a living woman that's channeling the archetype or something some sort of divine healing or a temple prostitute yeah you gave the answer at the beginning well All i the didn't, I didn't know was to my give intention. back your answer <laughs> that, that my you intention. seeded the meeting <laughs> it, it felt a bit vulgar to even use that term but it was just it was just the actual translation for the hebrew that so. might be your answer Maybe that's my answer. We got to find a religion that's doing all this sacred temple prostitutes, sacred sex. And that's people just need sexual healing. If I had that meme, I could play that right now. <laughs> I didn't see this coming. <laughs> we need love, and the only way we can we can express a bit more vulnerable love is through sex. We don't know how to talk it out. We don't know how to connect friendship love. It's just this really narrow ideal of sex or eroticism. So how do I wrap this up?
So part of the problem isn't double binds. Maybe it's um, negative double bind into a positive double bind, or taking that double bind into a paradox that helps you uh, become more human or develop a spiritual practice. So turn the double bind into a paradox. That's also the same territory as com combining the split. Existence is naturally binary. There's natural opposites. Being human is learning how to have space for these paradoxes and these opposites. And as a general rule, when there's a double bind, more context is the solution. Zooming out, more community, more connection, more love, more space. That makes the double bind more tolerable, or it makes the double bind evaporate, because there wasn't a double bind. It was a mind trap. Or a stopping point to sort of work on this puzzle of humanity and then say, okay, that's everybody struggles with that. It's a place to stop by and visit. So did I cover it here? Maybe I covered some of it here from a spiritual approach. That's so funny. I love this whole pointing out extremes. It makes me feel like so much more clear-headed. We're just keying in on naming entertainment noting practices, using your attention to gently touch different energies. So name entertainment, that's using language to contain your strong emotions and your impulses. And then you can stretch the extremes by trying to say, if the double bind happened here and here, what's the worst case scenario? So you try to expand the double bind so there's more space in the middle. adjust a system and then magic happens yeah it's, I wanna, that's why i'm clarifying with you so when i go do it on my own i need to really verify what it means to be gentle well you um, learn to be gentle by being rough so nurturing space you can channel an archetype but also through pain feedback <laughs> you learn how to be gentle to get the right amount of firm touch it's a feel. It's a visceral experience. Yeah. <laughs> oh, like the, the variety? Yeah. Gentle is the right fit. Too rough, too soft. Gentle is in the middle. That's so funny. I love this whole pointing out extremes. It makes me feel like so much more clear headed. My normal way of going about it is like holding on to an idea. I contemplate the idea and then I try to do it versus like literally visually seeing that idea in a more holistic space in a larger ecosystem on the spectrum. So instead of trying to force the outcome, if you see the awareness of the problem and it's well defined, maybe the answer comes out of the environment. Maybe it's like, I understand the problem. Then there's a fucking most obvious thing to do. That's your fucking answer. Stop trying to super overlay your answer onto a new situation when maybe the answer is already there. And the more you project an answer onto a situation, the more blind you are to the other possibilities. You're automatically going to filter what you're seeing based on your bias of the answer, of the boundary. And if you have more hyper self-reflection and you're projecting a boundary, you're just making yourself stupid. Because when you merge into hyper-reflection, you forget all that boundary shit. <laughs> so then you can hate yourself more afterwards. And that's a mess. In a larger context thing. You've expanded how that happened. Just that you pointed it out. I was like, oh, 
these are all extremes that exist on a spectrum. And I wouldn't even say spectrum, that's like still one dimension. They exist in a, in a whole space, a whole ecosystem. I'm just saying you're really good. I've had more therapy than you can count like four or five years. And I feel like I've done more in this session. The middle ground is missing. The ability to exist in this world and be malleable and be paired playful when it's safe and then kind of be cautious when it's not safe. The ability to do both, I guess. If you have the capacity to be extreme here and extreme here, then the middle ground should be humongous. That is hard to find because your focus is narrow. The Are middle ground is too big. That's, that makes me feel very safe. It makes me feel like there's a lot of opportunities. The middle ground is so big. Yeah. You're trying to project your extreme narrow focus towards the middle ground, assuming that it's the same size as the extremes. Mm. Yeah, but I if am the kind extremes of... are very far apart, sort of intuitively know this. That means the middle ground is much bigger than either extreme. Yeah, the middle ground isn't, isn't one tunnel yeah, it's not one spot. Yeah. Well, a whole forest to run in. A whole field. It's space. And the awareness of space. This is the basic message. Space and the awareness of space. Dharma Ocean Mantra. Space and the awareness of space. This is the basic message.